Luke, and uh, thanks for having me. It looks like a, a really good uh, series. So I really appreciate everyone um, coming today. I know it's uh, my own experience. <laughs> it, it, it's difficult to, to look away from, from teaching in the first week of the semester. I, I forgot how exhausting it is. So I, I, I've done a bit this morning and for the, the first time since obviously uh, uh, we broke up uh, last semester and uh, uh, <laughs> my throat is almost hoarse after only two hours. So apologies about that. Um, I know Luke said to be 10, 15 minutes of questions, but if, if you have anything at all, uh, like during the talk, just, just throw it in the chat or you know interrupt me, it, it, it's fine. And I'll, I'll try and leave a bit more room for Q&A uh, at the end, because I kind of always find it a bit more interesting to have a, have a discussion about the research rather than me talking at you for, for an hour. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the work I have today is, is, is about uh, music and aging, really, and uh, I have uh, Christine O'Kelly here, who's the director of, of the AFU in, here in DCU, who, who will hopefully be able to, to add a little bit to uh, explain the story of this research, because it wouldn't have been able to happen without her at all. So uh, it's great to see Christine here today. Um, we can blame her too if it's rubbish. <laughs> Um, yeah, so well, not a bit technical really. Yeah, so just a bit about me. I know as, as Luke uh, alluded to, um, I work in here in the business school as an associate professor in, in marketing. So, like my first question, if I, if, especially if I'm outside the business school, if I see a, a project like this and even the title that I have, I I would be wondering how uh, a marketing uh, lecturer and you know someone who studies consumer behavior how like that contributes to, to projects regarding uh, your know, well-being and community considering um i suppose i could say it considering the damage <laughs> that uh, marketing and consumer behavior does to, to these kind of central issues well well in my opinion anyway um i suppose i like to think of myself a bit of a, as, a, as a as a researcher um that's kind of you know comes from a critical marketing lens or critical of consumer culture so um I look for methods that can potentially be, you know, in, in inverted for good, I suppose, in, in this approach. Um, yeah, so I suppose my, my main research, as, as Luke alluded to, is around kind of the context of, of music and, and more recently sports. Um, but theoretically, it, it tends to kind of focus on, on, on cultures, particularly subcultures and communities and the impacts of of neoliberalism on, on identity, emotion management. And with this, as you'll see with this particular research project, there's always kind of specific emphasis on, on new digital technologies, uh, digital technologies. Right, so I suppose as a kind of way of contextualizing like this specific project uh, that we did, um, I have to talk a little bit about uh, music and well-being to give you a bit of background uh, on that. Um, yeah, so I suppose the, the first thing I want to say here really about when we think about like, the idea of the relationship between music and, and well-being is uh, beware the tropes, okay? So what, what do I mean by tropes? I suppose there's, there's a sort of public perception of music as some sort of like therapy drug that can help with all sorts of ailments. I would like it to a sort of kind of Hollywoodization or a sentiment mentalization of like the power of music. So I suppose like, you know, I suppose it, it's kind of like a, a Patch Adams type of effect as opposed to being with comedy, it's with music. Like it kind of, it can be over uh, sentimentalized and without actually looking at, you know, what the, the realistic relationship between um, music and, and well-being actually is. Now, that's not to downplay that there's an awful lot of research, obviously, that looks at, you know, its specific role in like in, in, in pain control and in, in palliative care. And, and and particularly there's loads of really good interesting stuff done around um, its impact on memory related uh, diseases. However, um, as uh, Ansdale and, and Denora, who are kind of big influencers of, of this particular work, uh, state they're, they're very critical of what they refer to as as the neuromania you know so this kind of simplification of the understanding of how music directly impacts health and well-being you know their argument essentially is that it overlooks the complexity of, of music and the complexity of the impacts that it has on an individual 
So a lot of the research looks at it in very instrumental terms of like, you know, the cause and effect of, you know, greater music yeah, consumption, you know, uh, greater sense of, of social well-being without actually unpacking how that actually works and the dynamics of it. So they call for what's, you know, what they frame as a, a socio-ecological framework of music and well-being. OK, so this is essentially looking at what music does in, in a far more uh, holistic way than just kind of this kind of cause and effect uh, relationship. So we build on this work, you know, in this paper contextually by by concentrating in particular on the everyday use of music as a resource for well-being. So th this is particularly important and looking at it from an everyday perspective uh, within the community. OK, so it goes beyond even the Norris and Ansel's work, which tended to focus on the they tended to focus on the therapeutic impact of music in like, you know, uh, mental health institutions or residential care facilities. So it was always like very much centered around uh, particular treatments, you know, uh, whereas I suppose this work is a bit kind of broader in focus and um, it's, it's more about, you know, its impact on well-being in the community and specifically, as, as we'll see, around uh, issues of, of, of aging. OK, so it's a bit of kind of theoretical background on that. I'll try and kind of keep it as jargon free as, as possible. Um, but another kind of background thing that's really important is, is, is the actual context of music itself and how it's changed as a as a kind of, I suppose, a consumer product or service to use the kind of language of marketing. So um, is that the big impact here, I suppose, when we look at well-being is that, you know, evolving consumer centric music technologies, so only like things like, you know, iPods, which are, you know, ancient now, but like streaming services and um, have allowed for like, you know, easier access, increased choice and greater mobility in consumption. OK, so essentially we now have like music on tap and we can have like any music we want essentially on tap for when and when and where we want it. So this is this is like the actual social and psychological implications of this. So, you know, probably being underplayed at the expense of focusing on the, um, you know, the economic aspects of it and how it's kind of shifted the whole marketplace and the whole kind of recording music industry. So these changes in terms of like choice and, and mobility that we have, like it's facilitated a much more personalized and, and potentially more effective forms of, of treatment. Uh, in this regard, so if we're to kind of bring this into the the well-being kind of sphere, so it's I suppose it's increasingly in more places of our everyday life, and the question this raises is 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 this a good thing, or you know how can we kind of maximise this if it is a good thing for for maybe populations and in our case age segments who don't maybe have as easy an access to these types of of technology. So um. Yeah, so that's kind of, I suppose, the context and then kind of, I suppose, positioning it within, like, you know, within the business kind of element and the kind of consumer uh, literature is, is essentially me taking this kind of social ecological framework and, and applying it to, you know, the everyday consumption of, of the music. So um, the transformative, I suppose, consumer research, I'll just get this up here. I don't know why I have. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the slides laid out that way. So in terms of, 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 you know, I felt there was an opportunity, you know, to kind of look at this broad question of the relationship between music and well-being it is not only to kind of try and understand it as you would typically do with, with a research project, but also use it as an opportunity to try and, and do something good with this type of research. OK, so so rather than just um, rather than just simply developing a research design that understood music and well-being, develop a framework, you know, that contributes uh, to our understanding of well-being and also actually tries to improve the well-being of the participants that are actively, uh, you know, a part of the research as well. So learn about it, but also try and do a little bit of good, you know, with the actual research design and the project that, that you're working on. OK, so that's pretty much the domain of what we call transformative uh, consumer research. And it's actually a whole field you know, dedicated to this, I think falls a lot in line with what the, the research, the community research center here uh, places emphasis on. Um, yeah, so what I can say, I suppose, in taking that approach is that um, it's very much influenced by the types of methodologies employed there, you know, so the stakeholders I partnered with 
um, in particular and my thinking around like actual implications and actions uh, with the findings. Okay, so, um, so uh, yeah, so this brings us to the actual, the actual study, um, which unbelievably was three years ago, <laughs> which uh, frightened the hell out of me when I started putting this talk together. Um, COVID really got in the way of disseminating this, um, but we do we did have a paper published on it, which I'll, 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 I'll get Luke to share around after the talk, um, which I suppose this talk is pretty much kind of a summary of, of that paper. Um, but I was even talking to Christine before this and saying it was kind of odd that any of like, the conferences or seminars that I did around this work was all kind of done by, by Zoom just because of, because of COVID. So um, it's, it's, it's been a kind of odd uh, period for, for sharing this type of research, but obviously there's a lot of advantages here too, where you can, you can do things like this over Zoom and, and people can attend who maybe wouldn't be able to attend under normal circumstances. Um, yeah, so the actual study, um, so data was collected between uh, the end of 2018 and uh, basically almost for an entire year up until uh, near the end of 2019. And the project, as you can see there, around adolescents, older adults and di digital technologies of transition. So we partnered with uh, Age Friendly University, as I mentioned, Christine uh, is here, who, who leads, is director of that network, who I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, and Christine in particular and her colleagues, like they assisted with the, the recruitment and the design of the research project. They were like, central partners here. Uh, we also partnered with two uh, local secondary uh, um, schools and one non-profit non -profit organization, uh, Fight and Words, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, so Fight and Words are dedicated to teaching groups of different ages how to write creatively, but um, we brought them in to help with writing uh, songwriting. So again, with all these uh, fighting words and with the schools, Christine and her team were, were crucial in, in, in facilitating those relationships that, you know, I suppose that they were already inherent with the, the wide network that the, the AFU has within, within the community, within DCU and beyond. And um, yeah, so you see all together there was uh, 24 uh, participants um, and it was kind of an even split, I think, between what we refer to as older adults in the community, 60 plus and uh, teenage adolescents. So this, I suppose, what we call this type of research design is kind of a participatory research design that evolved over time with consultation with not only Christine and her team and, and the other stakeholders, but also the actual research participants themselves. So like the initial plans that we had for what would look like was only really one phase. I think it was only going to be one or two weeks at first, and then it really evolved into you know, um, like two phases that took on a lot more time than I initially planned. But a lot of that also was because it was a lot of fun. So not, not just for how interesting I found the, the research findings we were collecting. So actually just another kind of note on um, the AFU while we're here, um, because I think any promotion of that is, any chance to promote that I think is, is, is definitely worthwhile. Is, uh, is like, as I said, they're so crucial to this project. But even if, for anyone here who's thinking about doing anything, you know, you know, related with, um, you know, with aging or you know, in any sense, or even like teaching, if you're doing anything that's related that they think could could draw from the AFU, I, I definitely recommend getting in, in contact with with Christine. Um, yeah. So in particular, like one of the things that was interesting to this project is the AFU places a big emphasis on on intergenerational learning. Okay, so to facilitate the reciprocal sharing of expertise between learners of all age, all ages. So that, that's one of the things that really came out of this project was kind of bringing together uh, the secondary school kids and the participants from the, the, the AFU. So that mix of, of research uh, segments was was very interesting to, to, say, to say the least. Um, yeah, and again, just, just a bit of kind of contact details for with Christine here and I'm going to rope her into the, the Q&A as well because I'm sure um, uh, Christine would want to kind of share some of, some of the experiences of, of working on, on this project. If you can remember Christine because you know as I said <laughs> it was three years ago now <laughs> and I had a lot more hair on my head and a lot less on my face then uh, as Christine has, has noticed. Um, yeah so just back to the kind of specifics of the, the, the project and how we went about it. Um, 
the data collection initially started, you know, there's two phases of, of, of the data collection. So phase one was, you know, was essentially about kind of delivering workshops uh, for the, the two age segments for the adolescents and the older adults uh, uh, together. And so the focus here wasn't really on like actually creating music. It was actually just about like using that as a discussion topic to talk about things like technology, to talk about things like like well-being, talk about things like like aging. So like the idea was that music would be a projective technique in which to generate generate insights uh, from these experiences. So because of like I suppose like the really interesting data that we were getting out of this, and as I said, because of the actual enjoyment of of working with uh, both the older adult, adults and, and, the, and the school kids and their own relationships together, which really kind of were really heartwarming to see, we decided to kind of expand it then to, um, to a second phase, which involved actually like creating something and actually creating something concrete in terms of, um, uh, in terms of music. So the actual direct creation of music. So this is where uh, fighting words uh, came in. So, um, yeah, so both of these phases involved kind of qualitative data collection methods, which involved obviously notes on kind of participant observation. We interviewed everyone that was involved in the project, uh, as well as the people within Fight and Words. Um, the, we kept, we got the participants to keep diaries for some of the workshops as well, just to, as another form of data collection that, that was actually really helpful. And we did things within the workshops, like things like music maps and other projected techniques to, to develop all sorts of, of, of different types of data. Some, some more successful uh, than others. So the diaries, for example, were, were quite interesting. We get them to keep music diaries of like memories of what they listened to that week and you know, memories are provoked and, and, and things like that. Um, and then like the second phase, as you can see there, um, was all kind of about the emphasis on, on, on creating something. Um, which alter, altered the uh, the actual makeup of participants a little bit. I think there was kind of one or two that couldn't make up for that, and one or two new that actually uh, joined it. Um, yeah, so like here's kind of some, you know, kind of some pictures, and we're terrible for kind of doing stuff like this for for uh, the first phase of the project. As you can see here, that's me doing rock and roll bingo. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Christine, <laughs> which actually ended up with um, a lot of people arguing with each other uh, and debating and getting really competitive, which was uh, really interesting. Um, that was pretty, pretty good. And then I suppose the, the second phase, uh, a note on that is that, you know, no expertise was, was needed in terms of, of music. Um, it was kind of come no matter how bad you are that the idea will be that we'd be able to teach it, but not we, so I, I, I sat in the background for this, but um, the guys from Fighting Words would be able to teach you how to, how to create a song um, uh, from, from start uh, to finish. So again, like no expertise was needed here. It was the idea that you could teach anyone. They actually performed the song at the DCU Cultural Festival, the Anam, that I think the last one was in 2019 or 2020. Uh, which is a really, mo a really like lovely moment to see them all together with with the song, and actually it was pretty good too. I must actually try and track down a, a copy of it to, to share with the group here as well too. And what was also really heartwarming about it was there was actually like one or two that were one or two people that were really talented. That actually had quite a talent, particularly I think the oldest member of the group in particular um, was very handy on the guitar. And there was a few young people that are really good. Uh, there was also a few people that are absolutely terrible, but um, you know they enjoyed it nonetheless. It's the same as everyone. Um, nowhere near as bad as me. So, you know, I'm trying to kind of just provide you kind of uh, the, the the outlines and the headlines of like the the main kind of phases of of the data collection here. And suppose what I need to get into is showing you a bit about the about the findings. So there was a lot. Um, I still have stacks of stuff in my office of different things that we had. Um, there's still a lot of findings I think we could have even had the potential uh, to develop, but I thought I'd focus it in particular on, 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 on three areas. Uh, one is the, the physical and mental well-being, uh, the structuring everyday well-being, and then I'll finish by talking a little bit about uh, intergenerational uh, well-being. So in terms of 
of physical well-being. I'll share kind of some of the some of the quotes, and again, just understand like obviously the names are being changed here to kind of protect a bit of anonymity. Um, but in terms of physical well-being, you know, as I as indicated earlier, there's, there's a lot of research about music as as, as therapy, and particular for those say suffering with kind of you know serious cognitive diseases. Um, and like obviously that research is all is all is crucial and, and plays a vital role. But um, we also we what we found is kind of like data data on on like you know more kind of everyday physical challenges that the elderly have in the community and how they use in, in music to to you know I suppose help and address that in in some ways. So for example, um, participants a lot of participants discuss using music to encourage movements around the house to get phys physically active. Okay, so. Even in this asterisk, uh, this extract, Molly describes uh, changing the words of like the Eagle song "Desperado" in her head to describe the situation she was experiencing with a dentist. You know, so she talks about listening to all music and drawing from that to manage the present pain that she was experiencing. Okay, so like this aspect of her findings like supports much of the, much of the literature in this area. However, I, I can emphasize again, like it, it can't be taken in isolation that has to be considered in the context of the broader socio-ecological framework like so what else is going on in Molly's life in terms of like internally or external supports and you know her engagement with the community like that all influences how she engages with music here and um, another aspect was was mental uh, well-being so we found evidence for the younger group in particular that this increasingly kind of like privatized consumption of music and what I mean by that is like you know you know having that kind of infinite amount of choice and and, and listening predominantly on on earphones in particular was was really good for their mental health and this was something that actually that a lot of the kind of older adults raised as a kind of that, something that they found problematic with how young people consume music now they thought it wasn't as social but like talking to the the kind of the adolescents and the the, the younger people about how they consume music in this way actually changed a lot of the minds of the, the older participants because of how they talked about how it helped them, you know, uh, with their own mental health. So, you know, throwing uh, headphones on the headphones was good for them to, to de-stress from school, work, etc. And it was quite an interesting, like, discussion uh, around that. So, like, in this slide, I, I focus, actually, even, like, you'll notice with the quotes that it's, it's, it's mostly about the, the mental health of of the uh, the elderly segments, so you know it, it's important to understand that the majority of the segments, for our sample anyway, I'm not sure if that's representative of, of all the participants in the a AFU. They were making a transition into into retirement, and you know, and there's a bit of a, an identity struggle that's there. So just as there's an identity for struggle, identity struggle for teenagers making that transition into adulthood, the same kind of structures of that transition are also taking place with with maybe elderly that are, are, are transitioning into retirement so um yeah so you can see here even with, with the quote like Anne speaks of this identity struggle and how she she drew on music to make sense of this to deal with the mental challenges of, of aging and the potential uh, stigma of, stigma of it so the power of music to draw from memory is, is is particularly noteworthy here so like furthermore we have like quite a lot of data of participants talking about uh, you know bereavement and so music helped the older adult, adults to kind of you know to you know to process that in some way to travel back in time to draw from places objects relationships uh however it also can be used you know to, to transport them into the future in a way that can, can ease anxiety so like we've been seeing that a lot in, in the actual songwriting process itself like that a lot of these kind of feelings and anxiety were projected in you know the actual lyrics of the song and the actual discussion around the lyrics of the different things so it's a really good projective technique um yeah so as you can see like music can be a great source of comfort here and you know a great source of hope not just for the older adults but also for the, the adolescents in, in in that sense so um yeah i suppose there's kind of i suppose what i discussed there already is you know there's evidence of that in the literature and there's different tweaks that we have because of the age samples that we have and because of different quirks of like kind of new technologies that have evolved and um, but I suppose one of the main contributions that we really have and drilling down to what's different about this research is is the emphasis again on that kind of 
holistic understanding of well-being and really actually just looking at the mundane everyday use of music like not the kind of spectacular kind of you know hollywoodization of it that i i kind of alluded to at the start of the talk and um, so like it's this everyday aspect of the consumption that's that's really interesting for me because as we deal with the physical and mental health issues that, that come with transitions that both of these uh, um, groups are experiencing you know the identity struggle that comes with that you know there's an awful lot going on but music can be something then that can be used to develop order and structure it's not all about you know the reflective and kind of um you know emotive uh kind of engagement with the music it's actually just it can be a very functional thing for creating a routine and and, and creating uh, order so like even for younger groups this is far more obvious like they really embrace like things like spotify and technologies like that with, with specific playlists for for management of different tasks and management of of different moods and i've seen that in a lot of previous research I, i've done too about how emotional management will work in that way and task management will work through streaming music and um, well what's interesting about that and that's where the kind of the groups start to merge together is how over the cor course of the workshops the elderly groups started to to learn about these technologies uh as well you know so there's a bit of that kind of intergenerational learning that you know, christine puts a lot of emphasis on with her work with with the with the afu so although, although music is part of like the structure and, and routine already for example like you know we have radio in the morning maybe a cd to wind down in the evening technologies like streaming offer them the opportunity to bring music you know to a much greater degree you know where it can work on the foreground as we've seen with physical and mental well-being but also importantly in the background where it becomes wedded to the development of, of a routine and this is equally as important but it's something that's often overlooked you know so yeah like speaking to that um sorry speaking to that uh oh God. no it's not working speaking to that kind of intergenerational uh well-being um that's something that kind of emerged kind of not unexpectedly, but just like something that was really nice uh, about the project uh, is actually just bringing these two age groups together themselves through the kind of excuse or lens of music, like lent itself to, to like, you know, you know, actual increased well-being in, in general amongst those groups, like, you know, just by kind of act actively working together, you know, and like, so think about it as a really, like at a really basic level, like playing and talking about music is, is like obviously a really enjoyable and uh, experience and the sociality of the, these uh, experiences really enhances the sense of well-being you know and that, that's pretty much obvious so like how did this kind of play out the participants shared like knowledge of their music they shared knowledge as i said of the different technologies and uh, and like that helped them both get more out of the actual experience of listening to music and and it made them respect their respective generations a bit more too and um, you know which was great because like i remember going into the first couple of sessions kind of like nervous about how the older how the adolescents would be with the you know the kind of the older adults like of whether they would you know oh, like just at a basic level like be respectful of them or would they be um would they be helpful with them and you know they were they were they were they were all that and like and even way more like they were just generally just kind of created really good relationships with them like that were you know all based around this kind of like these city workshops and this like city research you know and that was like one of the best things that could come out of it um you know so like one i suppose to kind of like articulate this in a greater sense uh both groups like they use the music to kind of create a shared sense of what i call time and space you know that that connected people but also like material objects so I kind of alluded to it already like music was like almost a time machine to say for example educate the young in particular about like what dublin looked like you know 30 40 50 years ago what the political and social environment was like at that particular time so like that would come through com conversations about things like you know about say how like you know elvis was censored in the 50s and 60s or about like um you know like that would raise all sorts of like discussions around what was going on in ireland at the time and again it would work the other way around too like where you know the kind of older group could learn more about like this generation's technologies but also like their kind of their politics and their 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 kind of lived experiences as well through like asking them about you know 
what's popular with music and things like that. So, you know, I see this at the individual level too, where like participants would create like almost a biographical self that they could articulate through music. So they point to particular moments um, in their life that they associate with music, owning their first record player, you know, buying their first album, first wedding, first dance at a wedding, they, and even like really mundane things that they can remember through a particular song. Okay, so, you know, for the younger group, it was more about, um, you know, looking towards the future, but they also use similar techniques to kind of create a sense of like a, a bio biographical self, like, you know, memories, like had that association with particular songs, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so again, this was really seen when they came to actually create the music in the lyrics of the song, because the song was all about this, especially with the young people kind of leading the lyrics, it was all about this kind of anticipated freedom and this like liminal space that they were in between being a teenager and, and an adult. And, you know, discussions of that kind of, you know, were brought, were projected through the music again, to uh, repeat that point again. So yeah, like there was, there was there's loads here um, that we had, and it's actually, I find it very hard to condense it into, uh, a kind of a, an hour long or a 40 minute presentation it's actually almost easier to to say what it was in 10 minutes or it's either you need 10 minutes or you need about four hours thank god it's not four hours you won't want to hear me talk about this for four hours um but like in terms of like what's like let's kind of get our research like kind of goggles back on like what were the contributions of, of this research in, in my view so firstly for the kind of transformative consumer research kind of lens and discipline that's there. There's a real contextual contribution. Like there's no research in this area that like focuses on the arts like in any meaningful way uh, or in the con arts in the context of, of well-being and uh, potentially vulnerable groups. Um, as well as that, um, the focus extends to kind of typical lens of, of music therapy studies. So as I said at the start, there's always an emphasis um, on older adults in, in residential care or individuals with specific uh, health issues, you know, or maybe even with teenagers as well, just like, you know, relationship between music and mental health. So it's a very kind of instrumental way of looking at it at times. So opening it up this way is, is taking a more kind of communal and a more uh, holistic approach, that social ecological framing of well-being, I suppose that uh, I, I'm putting forward there. Um, yeah, so it's used by participants to, to connect to memories, objects, places, relationships, and ultimately each other. Now, that's a lot more complicated to, to flesh out than a direct kind of cause and effect type of music and well-being type of study. But um, I think it's a good way of kind of starting the conversation around it. And it's a realistic way of, of, of understanding the topic, even if it is broader and more complex. Um, so I think as well you probably hinted from, from from what I've been saying is that it's and maybe what others could get from this that are, are interested in in maybe experimenting with, with new met methodologies is that it's really help music is a really powerful methodology in itself and it doesn't have to be a, a study about music it could be a study about anything but actual the actual like medium of music itself is, is really um is really good for uh opening up people to, to talk about themselves, uh, to help people articulate points of view in a more kind of coherent and a more kind of experiential way uh, that maybe just using standards like interview techniques or observation can provide it at points. So, you know, it takes, I think it takes a bit of experimentation with it, but and obviously it helped with this study because this study was specifically about music, but um, I would think about experimenting with it in, in, in other contexts, even just as a, a projective uh, technique. Um, yeah, and then the other one, I suppose, is, you know, the emphasis within TCR and the emphasis, I suppose, within this kind of research series is, is about, you know, empowering individuals and improving the lives at the same time as conducting, like, you know, scientifically relevant research. You know, the two, well, I learned from this, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive you know so it was good to have kind of make us like have a small difference where you know these two groups of people just had a really good time for a couple of months um talking and making music you know so something good can, can come from this type of research sometimes um i kind of just want to finish talking a little bit about the idea of like community engaged research because obviously not all my research is 
would would follow this type of kind of framework or in, engage with the amount of stakeholders that we did we use a lot of different approaches but this is by far like the most enjoy and enjoyable type of research to do i think and um i think like i know i've only focused on one particular project here but i think my framing of it is kind of indicative of how i envision and what i like about community research like it places in, emphasis on the holistic um, and includes as many stakeholders community stakeholders as possible i think that's really helpful and um, i think particularly again i'm very cr cr critical of kind of like cause and effects like types of research and i think uh, particularly projects like this can kind of show you the power of of bringing different state community stakeholders into complex problems and um, you know i think even for actually finding your research questions initially like engaging with different groups like the AFU is really good for formulating those thoughts in my experience. Like even if you're coming with a, a very uh, a broad type of uh, question that you have in mind, like I found like talking to Christine, for example, or and, and figuring out like what her group did, what her network was like really kind of helped me sharpen like the types of research questions that I could investigate. So like even actually in just the, the development of, 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 um, of like kind of research questions, like getting involved with community stakeholders is, can be really good. Um, however, as I kind of identified here, like there's so many challenges to doing research like this. And like, I'm going to be like brutally honest here because first, like you need to get really lucky that you have kind of access or uh, connections with organizations like the AFU. Like I've just, they just happen to be on my doorstep here in DCU. So really lucky that like not only where they like engage with stuff like this, but they just do really good work as well. And um, got me access to the older adults and even the schools and, and fighting words as well. Um, but I would say it's so difficult to sustain like kind of programs and workshops that like we did and relationships like this, like that whole kind of all those workshops and the different phases of it, that, that was a full-time job almost at one point. Um, and obviously the majority of academics like can't do that sustainably over a longer period of time because you know so that leaves us I suppose with problems when we, we consider the sustainability of having a, like a lasting impact with community type research like so something like this is once off but in reality it was to have a proper impact on the community like like I hoped it would it, it would need to be something that like continues to run you know not just a once off like so like I wasn't able to do that because of obviously you know um time pressures resource pressures so you know that that's that's a problem with things like this i think in the long term um yeah so like you know there's no framework or structure to to follow in establishing these relationships as well so you kind of have to sort of sail into the wind really and uh, furthermore like because of like the time intensity to them like there's not many professional rewards that come with this type of research like it'd be a million times quicker for me to run a survey on music and well-being and then bang out like you know two or three papers on it because I'd be able to collect the data much in a much quicker and a much more efficient way in half the time uh, rather than like slow paced collaborative research like this you know so like we all know how kind of universities and different schools work like the, the, the quick publication incentive is, is what institutions you know rewards like so we talk about impact but ultimately i'm not so sure that meaningful impact can come from working with you know such organizations you know, because it's 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 not incentivized or rewarded in reality, and it should be incentivized and rewarded in like more, I suppose, uh, more visibly. I think, um, because that's when we get more interest in research done, the more experimental research done as well. Um, anyway, regardless of those, like projects like this are completely worth it in my opinion. As you learn so much, you feel good about it as well, I suppose, to a degree, and then you also get to do you know your own academic thing as well which is, is also what I, I love doing myself um yeah okay so anyway my uh my rambling is over uh i think i see a couple of questions there in the chat sorry i didn't see them there and um, but i'd be delighted to hear any kind of questions comments etc um that you, any thoughts on it to see uh to think about it in a different way so thanks for taking the time to to listen to my uh gibbering <laughs> Um, Luke, will I answer the chat questions there or?
Yeah, okay. sorry, I was just going to say people can ask questions directly, or we can go from the chat. Uh, sure, Gary, you can read, you can see it there now. So yeah, I can see uh, that. Yeah, uh, um, answer that question there from Yvonne if you'd like. Yeah, so Yvonne's asking for tips on using music as a method in research. Things that you found well didn't work well. Could you combine music listening with one-on-one -on -one interviewing? Would it always work well? Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a good tip like i suppose in kind of my space if you're looking at things like everyday consumption i found the music diary was very helpful that you're really gonna like say for example with a project like this if, if one of the the lenses was focusing on like just aging itself like or say you wanted to look at maybe like the impact of the transition between uh working and retirement you know and um, like it may not necessarily be about music but if you ask them to keep a diary of what music they listen to throughout the week you get a really kind of and, and like how it made them feel you get a really interesting insight into like their their moods their emotions and kind of like even just even the activities that they're doing throughout that week so whereas if you ask them to maybe do like a playing kind of diary of what were you up to during the week and how would you feel about it you might not have that um kind of bridge in which to in which they can articulate how they really feel so like that's where you kind of get uh like some of the quotes you had there from some of the participants that came from those diaries of them actually reflecting on like memories they had or people relationships that they have or you know thoughts that were crossing their mind because they could articulate it uh, through the music um like i'm trying to think what else like i think we ask about um because you combine music listening with one-on-one -on -one interviewing and i'm not sure i didn't try that i suppose like there might be ways of of doing that it could be i suppose from a practical element being able to hear what each other is saying and recording it that could be problematic in that way but i, I presume it could you could figure out one way of doing it another thing that we did actually was that it was really helpful especially with the kind of younger adolescents was the um uh getting them to create like playlists for each other and then having a conversation with say a group of two or three of them about their playlists like to get them to share them with each other because they'd start trying to justify their choices and things like that and they'd start like you know go, oh, i never heard of this song who are they or you know especially when you were merging the kind of older and the younger demographic with that that was a great like icebreaker and um, for like say something like a focus group or, or something like that so like yeah there's like a variety of different ways to do it like i think that what ended up being probably the most powerful apart from the diaries was actually just the the creation of a song like you really get they, they, a lot of them are really bearing their souls like you know with some of those lyrics and having discussions about you know what they wanted the song to be about and what kind of message they have but again like the logistical like difficulties of doing something like that in terms of having the time resources and expertise as well like so we were blessed like to have five words actually like there to teach the group how to, to write a song to have professionals to do that like if it had to be me trying to teach them how to write a song god knows what well, jesus christ <laughs> it would have been a disaster <laughs> but uh that's that's a, another thing i think um i think we have the hand up uh, momentarily before the other message in the box so go ahead there uh you, you yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you, Gary, for your very easy work. Um, because your research subjects involve teenagers and some elderly people who might be vulnerable, how difficult was it for you to get uh, full approval from the universe, university's research ethic committee? Was it very smooth? Yeah, do you know what? Like, I, I ask this a lot because um, in, in, in the general area, they're like, I would have done a lot of my kind of work, like early work would have been around music consumption. And almost like I'd say 90% of studies done on music consumption are, you know, the sample is, you know, 20, 25 year olds. So basically, or 22, 25. So basically what's happening there is like all the research is, is it's a convenient sample for the researchers to just use students. Like, okay, so that can be quite problematic then because like, you know, a research field dominated by, you know students are typically a certain social class and obviously a certain age and um, you know it's going to be a problem so i was always looking for ways to do stuff with younger people or older people from outside that demographic so i think 
one of the things that that um impedes research like that is this perception that it's really hard to get like ethical uh, approval and my memories of it were that like the ethics committee were really like helpful and supportive with it you know like they outlined exactly what i'd be doing we outlined exactly um you know here would be we would be working with with the schools uh with christine as well and her role in it and uh, how the AFU worked and like if there was well, any with any ethics applications I presume there was one or two things that we had that were like maybe oh you won't be able to do that or these are safeguards you have to put in and, and whatnot but like I don't remember it being overly complex or complicated like I, I found there actually the ethics committee were um were really helpful in that regard I don't know if that answers your question really yeah it? that's like, why yeah great thank you Eric. thank you so much yeah. thank you Sorry, Luke, I've seen a question there from um, from Emer as well. She asked about uh, what genres came to the fore, the likes of Bach, classical, etc., uh, likes of Irish language song, what ethnic background do people have, um, what socioeconomic backgrounds they have. Yes, yeah, so like, uh, I think pretty much, I think I think it was about almost everyone involved was was born in in Ireland uh there was a i think there was it was quite a wide uh socio-economic backgrounds in terms of the older adults whereas the the schools would be i'd say you describe as as i, I suppose it would obviously from a similar background but it would have been schools like located in in like glass and Evan, uh, and kind of associated areas so they would have a similar kind of socio-economic background in in, in that sense and in terms of the types of music, it was white. There was a lot of traditional Irish stuff amongst the older adults. There was a lot of um, kind of obviously contemporary genres, like things like trap and stuff with the, the younger kids, not not just trap, obviously kind of hip hop and rap and all as well. Um, but there all would have been kind of shared interests in in things like David Bowie and the Beatles. Like they would have kind of bonded on that. I don't remember too much on classical, though. I think it was one or two that were interested in that, but not amongst the the younger cohort as, as far as I can remember. Yeah, we have another question from Una um, asking if there was a particular definition of well-being that you used or not, Gary. Yeah, like <laughs> I, 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 no, I didn't use it. But I think like, if we look at the paper, I probably use in the transformative consumer research definition of well-being, but it was actually something I struggled a lot with doing it in, in writing about this topic in terms of actually trying to 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 ground the discussion in a, a particular that, understanding of what yeah, that wasn't means. that wasn't meant to be a trick question i was genuinely curious because i found the same in trying to find it's a surprisingly hard mm. literature isn't it to, to yeah no no i didn't i didn't think you were you, you were saying that i just <laughs> i i still find it very difficult and I, yeah. I, I noticed a lot of the stuff that i read on it kind of tends to maybe similar to what I wrote as well tends to kind of dodge the question mm, you know? yeah. but it's kind of something that's it's it's felt inherently like we know what well-being is I suppose in this context like I, I would see well-being would be along the kind of lines of the findings that it can't just be seen as like physical well-being it has to be mental and, and social mm -hmm. as yeah. well so like as holistic a, a definite widening as wide a definition of it as possible is kind of the, the probably the school I would fall into it in trying to define it yeah thanks very much no worries. Uh, Christine, were you going to add something there or do you have a question of your own? No, I was just going to add there, Luke, that um, just to Yuhi's question about um, older adults and vulnerable older adults, I think there's sometimes a mistake that all older adults are vulnerable and you need to make sure that you're not going to get that into an ethics forum because vulnerable adults are in vulnerable situations, as in, in a nursing home, it's a completely different uh, approach to an ethics forum. So just to make sure that the proper term is older people, not elderly or old folks or anything like that. And just to say that, you know, vulnerable, you know, people perceive, may have a perception that because somebody is older, they're more vulnerable. That's not the case. You know, they're not a homogenous group. So in actual fact, what you do have is a variety of people. So if you're going to be doing something in a nursing home, you have a different approach in an ethics form, you know, because yeah. you have that vulnerability and people are in an enclosed, uh, you know, situation. And the second thing, just to answer Eber's question about the um, the, 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 the socioeconomic um, variety of people involved, 
the two schools, yes, were local schools. Um, it was Maryfield just up the road here and then uh, the school next door. But the other thing, too, is we did have two professional, semi-professional, one singer, opera singer, who was taking part in the programme and, um, and a jazz singer and somebody who was professionally involved in, in radio production. So just to just to say that um, I wouldn't have called it, they wouldn't be from various different backgrounds, but we had that variety, I think, of people involved as well. So just to say that, yeah. Yeah, I think I think like an important distinction too is that like all of the older adults that were involved um were were individuals who wanted to do further education. Like that's why they were involved with the AFU. Like this was kind of seen as a you know workshop or kind of like educational thing for for a large portion of them anyway. So like um yeah, so like they like even the question about vulnerability, like this is the thing what made the ethics application a lot easier. Like it's because we weren't dealing with any, you know. Uh, individuals with with um any issues cognitively or you know or, or physically in that sense like you know and like that that speaks again to this kind of everyday understanding like of trying to kind of move away from like this spectacular kind of framing of of, of this type of topic like you know where you know that you typically would see Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I feel over sixty is is is. Um, I think I just had that in the sample. I think the majority of the sample actually was sixty-five. Was, was yeah, we just we had one or two that just wanted to get involved, and then so I just kind of um, uh, shown the true representation of the sample. But even like you know. 65 is not old, you know. Uh, and just just to clarify that the, the, the UN, you know, defines older people as 65 plus, but the EU defines them as 55 plus. Oh, really? So, mm. Yes, yeah, so we need to be careful that we're in the, in the category. Well, maybe they shouldn't define it. They should just leave that. Like, and maybe mm. it should be uh, self, self-imposed self if you feel old or not, you know. Mm. I know, Christine, if you, like, are you any memories of, of doing it or anything that like you think is, is worth sharing? Oh, or... Absolutely. I, like, I think that, I mean, some of the things I've just noted here was, well, first of all, is the idea, like for people doing research with older people, the whole idea of co-created research is really important, where older people are actually involved in developing the whole research question as well. And I think that's something that we can help with in the age-friendly university, because we have about 2,000 older people, connections with older people, and a huge broad network of organizations, of course, we work with. The other thing that struck me as I remember back was um, when you mentioned a phrase there, you said young people, you know, who are looking towards the future, or older people might be looking towards the past. Well, one of the things was interesting was about, remember the Christmas songs? Oh, yeah. Found yeah. That the Christmas music was old music and that younger people identified more with the older music because when you think about it, when was the most recent Christmas hit? You know, in, in recent times that you could remember where we sing songs at Christmas time in particular, I thought it was really interesting and fascinating that both groups had that commonality between them, you know, that they liked that sort of older music. And then the other thing, too, was quite interesting to me was in the younger people, it uh, was the parental influence of their choice of music, you know, how it influenced their choices, what their parents played, what their grandparents liked, you know. And I thought I remember one particular girl really loved like 1950s music. So I had remembered back from the notes, looked, looked back to see her. And I just thought the other thing, too, is just to say that um, in Age Friendly University here, we're doing um, an Erasmus project on, on culture and prescription, which is around social prescribing and the impact of social opportunities on your well-being. So, for example, instead of going to the doctor and getting a medical prescription, you're going to get something around maybe developing maybe an interest in music or whatever. And the social prescribers in the country and, you know, all around the counties. And that's something that's very interesting and to the fore at the moment that we're looking at. At, um, in Ireland, we have a big report now done about what's available in Ireland. So it's been really it's been spearheaded by the HSE here and other countries around the world are trying to follow that lead, you know. So um, just and, and music is one of those areas, of course, you know, but the whole idea of what is culture and what is culture prescribing and how that makes people feel and the type of things that we can do. And that is ever ending. You know, there's loads of potentials for research in it, you know. So mm. it's a great project. I actually have a question, uh, if you don't mind me yeah. asking, if there's no one else uh, uh, going to ask. Just you had mentioned kind of uh, engaged research and how it can be time consuming and maybe that is one of the negative aspects of it, but it's definitely a very worthwhile practice to have. Um, the re one of the reasons why our centre is here and we have spoken to some of the faculties in DCU, is, um, especially coming from the EU, is that engaged research is really promoted. It's something that people 
really want to, to start doing. So have you found maybe from a funding perspective or even just uh, ideas being shared within your fa faculty or school that engage research to some extent should be involved in in more projects going forward? Yeah, I think there, I, I think there just needs to be more real incentives for it. Like, you know, so like it depends on what institution you're in or obviously even what country you're in, but like, like for most like faculty, but most like say business schools anyway, like, you know, the currency is how many publications you can get, like, you know, and like the quality of those publications. So like, you know, and you know, there's there's a lot a lot, a lot of flaws to having that as a policy, but also, you know, there's there needs to be some metrics in, in some way, like, you know, and one of the ways of kind of measuring how research active someone is is the amount of publications. But but for something like this like it's a very kind of long-term type of project like where you know uh any outputs that you're going to get from it are going to you know it's going to it's 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 not it's not exactly going to help uh if if you need to have that like fast output you know over a short period of time like you know so that's like you know you know where it, where it can be advantages of it i suppose is aware when you're you know speaking and writing about like what impact you've made as a researcher and that obviously comes into you know career and professional development as well like projects like this are very helpful for kind of illuminating the type of work that maybe that you do like that look here's the community partners and community stakeholders that are that you're working with but like i think the reality is is that that although like in in principle that stated that that stuff is is as important i don't think it it translates to the kind of bare metrics that you know um, are important for a kind of governing and um, like professional incentives within different institutions, you know. So, like you know, like again, it depends on the project and it depends on like the, the research funding that's available for something like this. Like, you know, I'm involved with something now that has funding, and that's obviously a lot help more helpful resources. We didn't have like funding for this particular project so that's that's a different story as well so again i think on the funding side of it with the funders they are more likely to fund like something like this that engages with stakeholders so that would be maybe the other side of the coin would be more advantages to it where you can demonstrate that type of impact so if, if that makes sense it's kind of a complicated uh thing to kind of yeah, yeah no it definitely um, is um but thank you for those that was very insightful uh, is anyone else any other questions? We'll uh, have them before the end. We have about four minutes left. If not, um, I'll thank Gary and Chris, uh, Christine again for, for coming to speak to us today. Okay. It doesn't it looks like uh, yeah, everyone's saying thank you now. Yeah. And, uh, thank you very much, Gary. Yeah, thank thanks very much, very Christine. much Luke, Christine. Yeah. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we have another uh, lecture in two weeks uh, by Martin Brown, uh, and we'd love to see uh, the same faces there and new ones as well. But uh, thank you very much. Um, Gary, if you want to share that uh, article with me, or yeah. publication, uh, I, can, I can include it um, in the, the in on the website, and then also uh, the recording of this will be on YouTube uh, at our website, and all the details will also be there as well if people want to watch it again or find the readings. <laughs> You don't want to watch it again. Thanks, but <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.